Okay, I think we're ready to go. So good afternoon everyone. Welcome to uh, your March Real Schools webinar. This one's called The Practice Shift. Uh, it's all about that art of supporting, growing and enabling teachers. And I, uh, I guess there's a couple of little frames that I want to get out of the way right at the beginning today about this webinar. And that is first of all that I think we need to, we need to get real about this. Uh, we need to be realistic about what's really going on in our schools, about the fact we do have very unique people in our schools as teachers and I want to, I guess, talk really frankly about that today through this webinar. So uh, if you came along to the webinar today hoping that I would give you a fantastic way to be able to change other people without changing yourself, then you're going to be disappointed. Uh, if you came today thinking that there is a, a magic strategy that I'm going to unveil before you today uh, that will allow you to have all of your people just as the as the picture on the screen that you can see at the moment suggests we're going to have everybody lined up neatly and they're all going to behave the same way, then again, you shall be disappointed. Today really is about what's required to get that shift in your school where we're thinking about, you know, we've got people who are actually focused on practice and they know that they have leaders in the school that are focused on practice. It's a very unique skill set that we're talking about and one that often as school leaders we're underprepared for. Uh, we, we really regularly have a problem in our schools where people get promoted into first leading or senior teacher positions, then AP and then principal positions and perhaps even system leader positions. And they get promoted into these positions largely because they were good teachers. And unfortunately when we arrive in these positions we find ourselves learning on the run incredibly quickly because the, the skill set required to be a good teacher is almost 180 degrees to the skill set required to enable, enable great teaching in others. And uh, what we're really talking about is what is it that, about, that is about our practice that we can become explicit about and what is it that we need to do in order to be able to communicate that. Not only to be able to communicate it directly, but able to, able to actually exude it through our behaviour and our thinking. So let's not shrink away today from the fact that when we are talking about making a shift in practice in your school, that we're talking about your thinking and we're talking about your behaviour. So uh, it might be a confrontational start that I've made there, but what we're on about today is actually trying to, in an hour, you know, we've only got an hour, is to make sure that we, um, that we have a fantastic opportunity to really stretch your thinking, to take your leadership thinking and your leadership behaviour on a jog around the block and to puff it out and to make it stretch and to make it uncomfortable and the hope that afterwards you will come up with some really fantastic you know, contextual approaches and ideas that are going to change what's, you know, what, what's really happening in your school because you know, really we, um, we, we can talk all we like about, uh, about theories and about, uh, and about different approaches but if it ain't happening in your school then it ain't happening. And uh, so we want to make sure that by the end of today that this run around the block has improved your leadership fitness and your leadership thinking and, um, and that you're ready to make some changes that are really going to make a difference in your school. So look, just the quick, I guess, the, the housekeeping, while well, I don't need to show you where the exits are and I don't need to show you where the toilets are or when afternoon tea is going to be, because you can do that while we're having a, a webinar today, not go to the toilet, but you can have your afternoon tea, you can feel free around that. Uh, just to give you an idea of what the controls are at your avail today, so what we've got is a couple of ways that we can interact today, so, and I want you to feel that you can interact, really important through these webinars, that we, if there's a question that you want to ask, if there's something that you want to uh, that you want to say or that you'd like us to chew on in some way that, um, that you actually let us know. So there's a couple of ways you can do that. Number one is you can put your hand up. So you'll see that there's a button there that looks like a hand and that allows you to be able to put your hand up and if you do put your hand up because you've got something that you think is really worth sharing verbally with everybody else in the, on, on the webinar today, then what I will try to do is to defer to you at some stage and I'll let you, let you have the floor, which means I'll unmute you and whatever your question or comment is, we'll, we'll do that. So I'll try and remember to do that a couple of times today. I've got my own control panel going on here and it feels a little bit like I'm the, the organ grinder at the crazy circus and uh, there's a lot going on so I'm going to try to keep an eye on those things and see what I can do. You've also got a question in the chat box as well. So if there's something that you would like to ask, I'll try and make sure that I go and have a look occasionally at that, uh, at that question box. And there's a chat area as well that you can, that you can actually you know, give a message that you'd like everybody else to see also. Um, around that chat and that question box, doesn't really matter which one you use, just use the one that you think is going to uh, be of greatest impact to you. 
So I reckon that that's probably enough, and it's probably time for us to get cracking on our on our webinar and really start to talk about what it is that we're going to talk about today. So um, for me first, the first thing I want to do is to make sure that today is incredibly contextual, which means I need to know who you are. So we've had over 60 school leaders who have registered for this webinar today and um, I'll launch a poll here to find out which particular role you have because I'd like to be able to tailor the, the work that we're doing today to the audience that we have. So I'm just going to launch this poll and give it about a minute or so to run and I want to know what role you're in, what best describes the hat that you're wearing here today. Mindful as I am that we have some people who are watching today in a, um, as a group and um, so if you could you know, take an average in your group <laughs> across those, uh, those questions that I've got there, I can see that we've got lots of people who are jumping on and voting already, which is just wonderful. I think we've got some people who are very, very used to the idea of the polls in our webinars. I can see we've got a good spread across those, uh, those key areas. We've got principals in the audience today. We've got some assistant principals, people who are in that senior teacher role also, and we've got some people who are very much aspiring leaders, which really excites me today because uh, you know, I think it's fabulous that you're interested in when you do get that print, that uh, that principal or even just that senior teacher or leading teacher position um, happening in your life that you are able to hit the ground running and perhaps the deep end doesn't feel quite so deep. So I'm going to close the poll there and make sure that I can share the results with you. And what we can see there is that we have mainly assistant principals in the audience today, but we don't actually have a group where we've got more than half of the audience. So we've got a fair spread there today. It seems that the system leaders are busy on us and we're all cool with that. But, um, but I welcome you all. And so what I do know from looking at this poll is that more than half of the people here are in that principal or assistant principal role, and a little under half are in that senior teacher or that aspiring leader position. So I'm going to try and make sure that I... Uh, We'll make a few adjustments along the way to cater for both of those particular groups, I guess, that we can see in that data. So what I'm going to do now is just hide those results and let's get back on with it. All right, let's have, let's have a look at the reason that you're here today. Like I said, I'd like to get fair income about this today. Um, I think that when you come along to a webinar and you, you register for something that's called you know, the practice shift, the art of growing and challenging and enabling and moving forward a whole group of, uh, a group of teachers, you're probably here because that task isn't particularly clear and it isn't particularly easy. It's probably because there's an elephant in your school. There is something that's really challenging and difficult about the, about the work that you're doing. And uh, we want to make sure that we, we get past that. Um, you know, that, we, that we actually deal very specifically with what it is that's going on in your school. So before we really get into any content today, what I'm going to do is to share one more poll with you and find out a little bit about what's the elephant in your school. Now some of these titles that you'll see coming up here are not particularly easy to read. We're talking about do we have a group of teachers in your school that are underperforming and you're finding it really hard to deal with them? Is it about orientating new teachers and they might be new to your school but they might also be new to, uh, to the profession? Uh, is it a feeling that your work, or your school or your work is not at the potential, it's not at the level that it should be? Uh, is your problem a time one? Is it feeling that you've got so much to do that we're not actually being able to focus in any kind of direct way and perhaps we're giving a little bit of piecemeal attention to the, the whole idea of supporting teachers in our schools? Or is it just inconsistency in your school? Is the problem that we've got some, some good stuff happening but it's not consistent? So have a bit of a think about that for just a moment. Uh, contemplate those, those different topics. I can see that we've already got plenty of people jumping on here. And I can see that inconsistency is a theme that's coming up a fair bit at the moment. So I know that sometimes you need to have a bit of discussion around a topic like this. So I'm going to let you have just a moment to, to get your vote in about where we're talking about here. And we've got a very, very interesting theme emerging. All right, last 10 seconds here, last, last 10 seconds to put your vote in about what's the, what's the elephant in your school, what's the real challenge in, in your school. And then I'm going to close that poll off and share some really interesting results with you. It seems that half of the people here think the problem around our practice in our schools is inconsistency. So people who, you know, they might be doing good things, but the fact is that they're not actually being able to do them collectively. Uh, what that, the risk around that clearly is transitions. So as kids transition either even into a specialist class or if they transition you know, from one year level to the next, then if we've got inconsistencies in practice, we often end up with um, yeah, we often end, end up with a situation where the teacher that is relieving students is trying to 
panel beat them into either the way that the whole school is practicing or the way that they're going to practice in the next year. And we, we have loss of time, which is a real problem for us. Um, we also see that they're not having enough time thing, not having enough focus in the way that we're supporting teacher improvement in our school is a real issue too. And a few handful of people are saying, you know what, my school actually is bubbling along all right, but I just feel like we're not quite reaching the level we should. And um, then I'm really pleased to hear there's a couple of people who are feeling brave enough to answer that way, uh, because you know that's a that's a that's a key reason that you might actually need to get some focus happening around this whole practice shift and how you're going to be able to incorporate some of the behaviours, some of the thinking, but more importantly, some of the work uh, around practice improvement into your work. So I'm going to hide those results. So we have a bit of an idea now about who's in the room, who's here with us today. We've got. Uh, a real mix of people, but we've got a real clear thing about teacher consistency that we want to get to work on. So what I want to do today is I want to, this is my frame I guess that I would like us to have a, a good think about today. Um, and the frame really here is about being able to look at the entry level for you uh, as school leader and your thinking I guess when I'm talking about that middle column there around school leader, I'm really talking about your thinking. I also want you to have a think about your school and I want you to have a little think about your focus as well. So what I'm trying to emphasise here for you is that this is all about congruence. This is all about noticing where it is that our work, our thinking and our school are at and is there a bit of a mismatch here that we could explore. So sitting behind all of these different labels for me is a, is a whole series of questions, a whole here series of statements of uh, provocative pieces that we could think about. But if you could think for a moment about your school, and I've sort of rather cheekily sort of stolen the, the A to E grading stuff from, uh, from, from our friends at ACARA there, in a way that we can start to think about where our school is at first. So if we said we're at any level, then for a lot of, a lot of schools I, I hear that, they're, that, that really feel like they're not performing at the moment, then they're talking about, the, you know, and I try to think of a, uh, a far more technical term, but the truth is that these, two, these schools tell me that they're stuck and they find change incredibly difficult. If we go up a level from there, then what we're talking about is schools that are incredibly busy, which means that what we've done to get out of being stuck is get active. We've started to, we started to do things, but in the process, perhaps the risk that we're taking here is that we're finding that the people in our schools are you know, feeling that they're overworked, feeling that they've got too much to do, feeling that there's not enough room to do anything else. So the teachers that I'm talking about here that, are, that have mentioned 36% of people talked about not having the time. You might start to think about whether your school's a bit busy, whether there's so many competing priorities in your school that we haven't found a way to prioritise an improvement in teacher practice and indeed the behaviours and the conversations that would need to sit behind that. If we went up a level, I guess that C level is always the middle of the bell curve. And now here we're talking about schools that are quite common in that they're very busy also, but they're finding that there's a little, that dotted line represents a real ceiling. And um, what we find is a lot of schools that are very common. We find schools that have, have got very similar values, have got very similar mission statements. And even though those values and mission statements often have some statements that are very aspirational, we might say that we're you know, trying to be excellent and we might say that we're trying to uh, you know, uh, we're interested in respect and responsibility and personal best and all of those kinds of things. What we're finding is that if everybody's excellent, then we're not actually getting through and, and stepping through into a space where our school would be at B level, where they're highly regarded. And we know that you're highly regarded because at this point people are starting to seek you out. People are starting to look over your fence. They're starting to not want to know what it is that is so special about your school. Why are you getting better results, even in one particular area or another? But what are you, what's that all about? They want to know about your literacy program. They want to know about your behavior and well-being work. They want to know what you do around bullying. They want to know what your team strap plan. They want to know what your targets are. They want to know what your focus on you know, on outcomes, whether it be NAPLAN or your or your year 12 results are. And, um, and uh, But it's the schools that actually don't sit on their laurels at that point that I would suggest get to that A level, where they're starting to actually stand out from the pack. And, um, and, and what we have there is a school that is actually changing the whole narrative about itself in the community. And there are wonderful examples of schools you know, all around Australia that have started from a really low base, that have started where there's been you know, significant problems, there's been low regard for the school, they might have a really inexperienced staff, it might be a low socioeconomic cohort, and uh, they've started very much themselves at, a, at an E-level, but over time and through practice they've been able to change the whole story of their school. And I know of one school that in particular has changed the story of itself so significantly that it's actually impacted property prices in its area. And um, they've done so in a rather upward way. 
be honest, we need to look sideways to this from our own leadership thinking. So what I want to challenge you about today is to have a look at that middle column around school leader and your thinking and, um, and whether your, your thinking is actually matching where your school's at. So when you have a school that's very much at a structural, uh, very much at a stuck level, then what you find is school leaders who are very focused on structure. So that means that they're really interested in timetables. We're really interested in making sure that our policies are ticked off. We're really interested in making sure that our strategic plan's organised. We're really interested in making sure that the school runs smoothly, but our focus is very much on what and not how. And so what we find is there's often reduced dialogue in the school and there's often a frustration with, um, with, with growth because people find that they hit the autopilot button. We go a step higher and we've got leaders who are very much thinking about collaboration. So we think a lot about how we can pull people together um, and how we can create opportunities for people to work. The problem is that this lines up with a busy school. So it means that often the complaint we get when we have a very strong collaborative focus, the complaint we get is incessant meetings. That's usually what they're telling is that they don't mind the idea of, um, of getting together, but the complaint is usually that they're not getting what they want out of that meeting. So, um, so that's, a, that's an issue for us. And it's, a, it's the schools that get up into this common area now where the leaders actually genuinely start to lead. And that means that your influence, and if we can look up above the, 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 the little magic ceiling there, the influence that we're trying to have is that our work is starting to rub off on others. So others are actually starting to, to pick up on the things they're doing. And we've got, I guess, the, the green shoots of some innovation starting to happen in these schools where you would say, you know what, my job's not to do the timetables, my job's not to make sure that the meetings run smoothly, but my job is to lead and my job is to make sure that others understand what my priority is. Uh, we go a step higher and we can see that your influence is very strong and by the end, all of a sudden, these A-level schools, they're the schools that I guess, you know, in a, in a, almost in a cynical kind of way, we, um, we, we have a situation occasionally where you know, the, these are the people that get invited to conferences. They're the people who, you know, they, they're so good at empowering others that they know that the, that the ship won't sink if they turn their back on it and attend a conference and speak for a couple of days. Uh, because what they've done is so wonderful and that the people there are, uh, have such a high level of ownership over it that they're able to that they're able to step away from that. The wonderful part about people who lead in the empower and the influence space, of course, is that their legacy is incredibly strong. And that's something that we're really interested in. So before I go and have a look at your work focus, I'm just going to pause for a little moment just to step back and just have a look at what's happening with the attendees in the room here. I'm just seeing that looking for any hands up. I can see Joan Courtney has got a hand up here. So Joan, I'm just going to unmute you for just a moment just to check in. Sometimes this is an accidental hand up, but sometimes it's not. So Joan, I'm going to unmute you and just see. Joan, can you hear me? Just see whether you've got something to say, whether you've got an accidental hand up. Joan, are you there? It would appear not. I'll close if off on Joan. Oh, you are Joan. Joan, I noticed you got your hand up. Is there a question you wanted to ask at this point? It was accidental. It was an accidental one. That's all right. That happens in class all the time. I'll unmute you again, Joan, and I'll, I'll keep cracking. Okay. When I'm talking about on the other side of this of this model that I want you to give some consideration to what your entry points are, we start to think about what our work focus is. And to be honest, at E level we're talking about survival. Our work focus is about getting through. So they're the they're those times and look it happens to all of us, but they're those times when we, we, we're we're trying to get through to Friday afternoon or indeed we're trying to get through to Thursday afternoon and just We've got our eye on 3.30 or 4.30 or 5.30 and that's where we're trying to get to. And our work tends to be very present focused. So we're not, we don't have much of a future looking uh, aspect to the way that we're working. And if you stop and think about all of the different tasks that you take on, whether it's the tasks that are perhaps in your diary, um, then, then you'll actually be able to look at them and say how many of these are present focused and how many of these are future focused. And if you find that we're doing a lot of putting out of spot fires, then we might say that we're in survival mode. D level is about looking at the evidence, so we're very focused on outcome. But C level is when we say, you know what, if we want to get a really productive outcome, 
then we're going to have to start to let our work influence process. The great part when we start to get to this level is that we notice that our work is geared around dialogue and we find that we're having lots of conversations with people about not what they're teaching, but how they're teaching. And this is where we find schools that are just starting to break through and we find school leaders who can actually take their work to a new level by making sure that, uh, that they're having conversations around the how of teaching and, if you will, the conversations about pedagogy that are then able to say, you know what, where are we going with this? What, kind, what are the themes that we've adopted here that tell us that we're, that what type of school we're going to have in three years' time? These are the schools that engage really well in their review processes, are the ones that are able to say that, you know, what's our vision here? What is it that we're, that we're trying to achieve? And very much then, once they say, right, this is what we're trying to achieve, we find that our purpose, our work purpose, is very much connected to that vision. So we'll find ourselves in a role where it's our, it's our plans for five years' time that are actually connected to the tasks that are in our diary and not just the, the cleaning up of the day before or, or getting to mistakes that have been made in the school. So what we can see here, I guess, when I say that this is all about congruence, it's about saying that, you know what, if we look at this and we say that our school's busy, so I'm walking around trying to influence everyone at a B level. School at D level, myself, my, my own thinking at B level. But the truth is that my work is very much about survival and cleaning up and putting out spot fires. Then what we find is a lack of congruence. And through that lack of congruence, we will undoubtedly get significant um, frustration in our own work. And the problem with that is that what we'll often do is look at our own leadership thinking and bring it down. So, and that's actually what we don't want to do. What we want to do is say, how could I lift my work focus from survival to evidence so that the gap is smaller between what I'm thinking and what I'm doing and the gap is smaller between what I'm thinking and where my school is currently operating. And for many school leaders who perhaps are, are new to a, not only leadership but are new to a new position perhaps have gone, you know, got moved sideways in principal or assistant principal positions, this is a real challenge because our school leadership thinking might be well above where they are when the school arrives. Well, you know what, it could be well below. We might be transferring into a really well-regarded school, but we come in determined to focus on structure, and that'll cause frustration not only in ourselves, but in the people that we work with. And so my contention to you is that any time that we're starting to look to what is it that we need to focus on to improve uh, the congruence in this model is about making sure that we start to get clear on our behaviour and our thinking. So for me, when we're going to look at our behaviour and thinking and we're going to actually make some changes here, for me it stands to reason there's a couple of considerations we're going to make when we step into that space. Number one is going to have to be that it's going to take time. Okay? It's going to take you time and effort and consistency to actually get some changes in practice. It won't happen just because you start to think differently once. It'll be because you start to structure to have opportunities to, to reflect upon the way that you're working with some level of consistency. Uh, it's going to take focus. It's going to take a consistent idea of making sure that we sit down and we do start to look at this model with some sort of regularity. Uh, it's going to take dialogue, and that's not about calling a meeting. It's about saying, you know, sometimes the best dialogue is had. I've, I know that I've had with my leadership team has been, you know, on a Friday afternoon over a, you know, a glass of your favourite, uh, your favourite beverage and um, and a nice block of cheese, and uh, you know, we've had some great conversations that I've had with leadership teams when we've just, you know, watched 15 minutes minutes of a video, perhaps watch a TED talk, perhaps just you know had a look at the, a model such as what we've uh, what I've just presented to you. And, and you know what? Without agenda, let's talk about it. And it, what we find is through dialogue that uh, that some key actions start to emerge that actually can go into your diary. It's going to take real intention. We're going to have to, if we want our thinking and our behaviour to change, we're going to have to be very clear about what it is that we're going to change. So I often talk about, you know, it's a uh, it's a Dr. Philism that you can't, uh, that, that, and it's a and it's a favourite of mine that you can't you can't change what you don't acknowledge. So what we're going to have to do is to get very intentional about what are the behaviours and what is the thinking that we're looking to challenge. We're going to have to reflect. Uh, it's actually one of the behaviours I'm going to suggest to you today is that we're going to have to start to reflect really honestly on our on the way that we work. It's going to take some patience. So not as we know when we're working with students and we're trying to change behaviour, the first thing we do is not, is not necessarily going to work and as it is with our staff. So it will take repeated exposure and repeated effort in, the, in this space to get the changes that we're looking for. Uh, in fact, it's often 
far more challenging to work with staff because they've had longer lives in which to practice some of these behaviours that we're concerned about. And more than anything, it's going to, have, it's going to take a focus on our own behaviour and thinking shifts. So it's not about changing others' behaviour, it's about changing ours. And when we can get clear about which behaviours are that we're, they are that we're trying to change, then, um, then what we're doing is starting to really think about what's our behavioural influence. I want to talk about that in just a moment. So for me, I reckon there's nine. I reckon there's nine behaviours that are very much worth exploring and very much worth having a really deep look at if you want to be an effective changer of practice in your school. Um, my number one is that we need, well it's not a number one, there's no hierarchy on need. First of all, we need to invent. I actually think that schools probably above any other profession are really keen on the, the concept of, uh, of changing language, of changing the meaning of words. I think that we, uh, for a while there, we, you know, we became uncomfortable talking about punishment, so we changed it to consequences without actually changing the meaning. We just changed the word to make it something we're a bit more familiar with. And I think we've done this to the word innovation as well. So innovation, I think, has become something that your staff have begun to view as one more thing to do. Uh, we know this because if you go to a, a really fantastic professional learning session or a conference or indeed a wonderful Real Schools webinar and you go back to your staff and say, oh, what a great idea, I did this webinar and it's really going to be awesome what we're going to do and I've got uh, things that can change around here, what we'll find is a fair amount of eye rolling. And it's because our staff have started to think of innovation as being an extra thing to do, and that's not the way it should be viewed. So I actually contend we need to start to look at how we're inventing things. Can we invent new processes, new processes that bundle up existing responsibilities and, uh, and make them easier to access? So what, can we come up with an invention that's going to make it easier for people to engage at meetings? Can we come up with an invention that's going to make it easier for them to be able to program and plan? Now, can we come up with something that's going to make the reporting in schools easier? Now, can we, can, can, inventions are about making our life easier. And it's through making things easier that sometimes we, do, we discover a little bit of time. So once you start to think about innovation, start to think about what is it that we're trying to invent as a leadership team. Uh, the next behaviour I want to talk about is failure. Um, I read recently a study that was all about, I think some people have got too much time and money, money to, to study things, but uh, the study I saw was about uh, the age-old expression that mums use, which is, uh, how many times do I have to tell you? And apparently the answer is 17, that over a short period of time that kids need to be told 17 times a particular instruction for them to be able to commit it to short term and then transfer it to long term memory in any kind of meaningful way, which is a frightfully frustrating thing for us. Um, the problem is that we're only in that situation are we, are we taking instruction as a way to learn. And as anybody who's, uh, who's maybe male, who's listening to the webinar, who's involved in the webinar today will tell you that uh, our mums may have told us a hundred times that we shouldn't be touching the stove, but the way that we learned was when we actually touched the stove. So one of the issues that we have around that is that we've eliminated the whole concept of trial and error in our schools. Uh, through the process, we've eliminated failure. We've created schools that are very failure and risk averse, and in the process, eliminated one of the most valuable ways in which we learn to, um, in which we learn, and we learn to improve our own practice and our behaviour. So what we want is schools where it's okay to fail, where we actually do genuinely view failure as an opportunity to learn and where the leaders in the way that they work aren't just walking around highlighting failure, but they're actually doing two things. Number one is they're highlighting the things that have gone particularly well, particularly from a process level. Sometimes when we get a failure in, uh, in, in outcome, the failure hasn't come because of a, a process, it's come because of some external circumstance. It might be a, a parent that's, re that's really you know, flown off ankle about something. Um, but it doesn't mean that we went about it the wrong way, it just means that the outcome wasn't what we wanted. Um, and when we can pick up on, you know what, we went through a good process here, well done. You know, let's use that process in other areas. And the other thing that the, the really successful leaders can do is to actually sit down and have no blame conversations around what happened with the failure. You know, can we learn something from it so that people start to receive feedback in a positive way? So, uh, you know, very much, I really like the quote here that's on this slide here from Churchill, that success isn't final. Failure is not fatal, it's the courage to continue that counts. And for me, I think that's what many of us are looking for in our schools, is how we can foster the courage to continue in our young, and not in our young people, in our staff, that's really important. 
We need to be able to fail, we also need to be able to reflect. I always throw it at people that I, I, I firmly believe that uh, if anybody is here today who has, uh, in the webinar today, who has either shaved or, or perhaps they put on makeup today or you just never know, perhaps they did both, but the chances are that you did that in front of a mirror and not in front of a wall. And the truth is that that because it is useless to reflect upon nothing. And you need something to reflect upon. And just when we're putting makeup on or shaving, we need to use a mirror. We need to have some sort of model or some sort of process or some sort of you know frame through which to reflect upon if we're going to you know decide upon it, if we're going to decide whether we've done a good job or not. And uh, for me, I know that I've spoken to many people about my model that I had, which was a very simple model, three sphere Venn diagram. When I opened a new school as principal, uh, it was about anecdote, evidence, and intuition, and I was able to look at that at the end of a a difficult day or um, even a whole term or even a, a whole semester and say, you know what, where did I go? Because one thing I do know about my model, anecdote, evidence and intuition in three spheres, is that I have a favourite one and that's anecdote. I'm story man. I'm an absolute sucker for a story. So I was able to reflect upon, did I get sucked into my favourite domain or did I make decisions with some sort of consistency? Uh, I could reflect upon it you know, while I'm at the traffic lights on the way home. I could reflect upon it you know, while I'm waiting to pick the kids up from football practice. And I can do it because I have a model. And um, for me, it's the times that we get in the car and we say things like, you know, how did I go today? Well, yeah, I suppose I did all right. And I didn't do very well there. I think a lot of that thinking is very wasted. It's not very, um, it's not very focused reflection at all. So what we want is a way to focus our reflection. So I can't encourage you any more strongly than to sort of think about what's the model that you have for decision making. And if you're able to draw that in some way uh, that allows you to think about what's the, you know, how, how is it that I'm trying to you know, make some sort of, uh, yeah, achieve some sort of consistency in the way that I'm working, then I think that what we'll start to find is that you, you're starting to reflect with improved focus, which can be a really valuable thing to do. All right, next behaviour for me is to think about your influence. Um, I actually am going to challenge you all when I finish today to say you know, of my nine behaviours, I want to have you a little th give you have a little think because I reckon one's going to pop up that you're pretty good at. I reckon one's going to pop up that perhaps you've got a superpower in and I reckon one's also going to pop up that you're going to have perhaps as your kryptonite, your one that you go, oh, that's, one, that's my one that I, I really struggle with that. So, um, and I want to let you know that I've done that reflection myself and here, here in front of you today, the idea of influence is my, this is my superpower. So what I know about myself by, through, through my reflective processes is that my influence is often really high. And that means that I'm pretty good at being able to communicate. I'm pretty good at being able to sell the vision. I'm pretty good at people being able to understand why, uh, I guess to be able to do that, to understand the why of the way that, that I'm working. And, um, and so to that effect, people buy in and people often have enthusiasm as a result of being in my, in my teams. And, uh, and that's a good thing because it means that relationships work better. Relationships certainly work better when, uh, when people are very clear on what's the purpose of their team and I'm really good at being able to show that to people. So I want you to start to think about what's the influence that you're having upon your teams. And um, to that effect, you know, we, we can't hide from the fact at all that uh, if relationships aren't good in our teams, then for me that's largely because of our influence. So we need to be uh, you know, mindful that if people aren't getting along, then it's usually because it's the way that we're leading and it's because of the influence that we're having. And that's a difficult thing and a confronting thing and uh, a challenging thing and perhaps a provocative thing to start to think about. Um, but you know what? No blame. You know, we'll, we'll get over it and I'm, very shortly I'm going to tell you about my, uh, my behaviour that's my kryptonite too. And there are things that I can do to improve that as well. So the next thing I want to do is to, is to have a little chat about whether we actually really get it or not. I tried to think of a really fantastic you know, teacher speak word that would, uh, that would make get it come to our attention better. But I guess my, my anecdote that sits behind Get It was uh, the fact that I do remember myself working with a, a teacher who was struggling in the classroom and was finding practice and finding behaviour elevation really difficult and finding relationships building almost impossible with her class. And I was quite regularly pulling her aside for a chat about it, having a good yarn with her about what it is that was going wrong, uh, how it was that she could improve things, giving advice was, was what I was doing. And I guess I thought that through that advice that I was doing a really enabling and uplifting thing. And 
to be honest, started to get a bit frustrating when her result, her performance didn't change. Uh, I had a really interesting conversation with her when I came to offer perhaps my thousandth piece of advice. And when uh, I could see the eyes starting to roll also, and I thought, oh, she's just not, not even receiving this advice anymore. And I said, what's the, the problem? And, um, and she let me know that, you know, perhaps that I wasn't really understanding what it was like for her, that I didn't get it because, you know, my job was to sit up in the office and to write policy and to organise staffing and to answer emails. And she said, you don't know what it's like for me in the classroom. And I thought, wow, that's a really interesting observation that here was a teacher that in conversation hadn't really actually realised that, uh, that I was a teacher and that perhaps I'd been promoted because I was a pretty good one. And uh, this was frustrating for me, but the truth, I, I thought about why. Why is it that she doesn't understand that I'm a teacher? And the truth is because I hadn't shown her. And uh, the reason she didn't, that, that, uh, that, I, um, that she didn't want to take on my advice was because she hadn't seen me deploy any of it. So I realised that the best advice I could give was perhaps a little bit of modelling, a little bit of co-teaching, just enough to buy me the credibility that this teacher will listen to my advice. So I can't encourage you any more strongly. Get your hands dirty occasionally. Not all day, not to the point where we're going to be completely distracted from the important work of leadership, but just occasionally our teachers need to see us teach. And then our advice and our, um, our instruction around the way good pedagogy needs to manifest in the classroom uh, has a chance of being received because they've seen us get our hands dirty and do it ourselves. So I can't emphasise any more strongly, your teachers need to know that you get it and the best way is to actually show up in the classroom. The next behaviour that I want to talk about is leverage. And um, leverage for me is all about relationships and that means that well, I've got a firm contender that as teachers I think we have two types of relationship builders. I think that we have teachers who build relationships because they feel nice and they're the, for me the blind builders, they're the people who build relationships just because they make them happy in their work. And um, I often say that you can almost smell the incense from their classrooms and you have this feeling that everybody's singing Kumbaya all day but not, but not a great deal is getting done. And um, they're not the relationship builders that I think we want in our school. I think what we want is people who build relationships so that they actually are transformed into performance. So what we want is people who are using relationships to get a higher level of performance from their, from their students. Indeed, that's what we want when we're working with our people. We want them to be so invested in a personal relationship with us, a personal, if you will, slash professional relationship in us, that they're not going to let us down in their practice. That we want people who, and this sounds quite manipulative, and it is. So you know, to that to that effect, get over it. Um, yeah, so for me, what we want is people who have such high professional and personal regard for us that we can use that regard to get them to do things that they wouldn't normally do. And indeed, I think that's very deeply connected to the art of leadership. So don't forget that relationships, the best relationships are the ones that you can leverage. The great news is that people actually want to be in those relationships. People genuinely would like to be in relationships where there's a high level of expectation and there's also a high level of support. Uh, for me, I also think that we need to simplify our messages. Uh, I think that people in schools, particularly teachers, you know, often feel that there's just too much to do. And as a result, they do nothing. And some of us can understand that phenomenon. We've, and many of us have probably had that day where we get to get to work and uh, we look at the list of things in our diary, and it's uh, it's so immense and so long that we close the diary and do none of them. And unfortunately, all of those things are still there for us the next day. And it's because we don't even know how to prioritise. Where on earth do we start with the enormous amount of things that need to be done in a school? So for me, what we need to do is simplify. We need to shine a light on what's critically important. Um, I, know that, I know a fantastic principal that I worked with who had his list of uh, JFDIs. Now, I'm going to leave you to think about what the F might stand for, but the, the JDI standard stood for just do it. And he had 12 things that he put up on the wall of the staff room, which are the things that are not negotiable. Now, it was things like student reporting. It was things like our NAPLAN regimes. Um, you know, it was things like marking the role every day. But we just got to do. Everything else is negotiable. Everything else we can work around. But you know what, there's a handful of things that we just have to do. And his staff really appreciated that. It was understood that what was an actual priority and it was understood where the space was to be able to negotiate and to be able to do things differently. Um, and it's not because any level of work disappeared. Simply, it was because he shone a light on what actually had to be done and shone a light on what it was that actually could be discussed. 
And um, so workload didn't go down, but the, the, what the, the understanding was in people about what needed to be done was made very simple. I really love that quote, that if you can't explain it to a six-year-old, you don't really understand it yourself. So it's about getting away from, particularly this is about you know, connects to working with our parents, it's about getting away from that whole idea that, um, that you know, we, need to, we need to sound like we, we know more than we do. So let's, let's talk about things plainly and let's make things simple for people. Getting towards the end of my behaviours here that I want you to start to focus on, I'm wondering, I guess, whether you've started to pick up on which one perhaps is your kryptonite and which one is your superpower. Um, the next one for me is expect and engage. This gets back to the whole idea of, even when you're talking about leading restoratively, it's about a higher level of expectation and a high level of support. So what we're talking about here is can we set the bar really high which most of us are really keen to do. As we know, we're unlikely to have a high performing school if the expectations are low. So can we set really high expectations? Can we set targets that are, you know, not, not, not crazy targets, but the targets that are you know, out, of, out, of, out, of, out of reach but not out of sight. You know, targets that stretch our people but not snap them, I guess, are the, the types of targets that I want you to set. But then can we also engage at a really high level and provide a, a phenomenal level of support for people to reach those targets? If we can, I think that we start to say that we're, we're, our people will describe that we're working together and they'll say that my leaders work with me rather than my leaders do the, these things to me. So we're talking here about, about can we achieve a high level of expectation married by a high level of support. And then what we're talking about here, welcome, welcome to my kryptonite, is the idea of scaffolding. So for me, I being highly influential and being also very, very um, you know, very dominant in the idea of anecdote and story. I have this horrible habit of showing up in the staff room, telling people what the wonderful vision is going to be, getting everyone wildly excited, and then leaving. And unfortunately, these pe leaves people sitting behind me as I leave the staff meeting, going, "Great, that sounds wonderful. What do we do now?" And um, the problem is that I don't have a natural tendency towards scaffolding. I don't have a great history of, uh, of natural planning. I'm not someone that enjoys Word documents. I'm not someone that, uh, that enjoys strategic planning a great deal. So even though I know that there's immense benefit in that, I know that, um, I, know that I have to actually make a decision to be sure that people know what the first step is. And then they know what the second step's going to be. And then they know why they're taking these steps. Uh, a couple of things can happen if we fail the scaffold. Number one is that I will excite and enthuse a lot of people about the, you know, the, the picture that I paint about how our school's going to be you know, very much educational nirvana. And then in three weeks, when it hasn't been achieved, my, my most enthusiastic people are now my detractors. I've let them down. I've really disappointed them because I didn't show them what we needed to do next. And that's not good enough. That's not good enough. So what I need to do in any moment that I've got a new implementation, a new idea, a change of course, I need to decide what are those steps that are involved for people who really need to see the process. You really need to see how it is that we're going to get somewhere and what it is that we're going to achieve. So um, while we might find sometimes that our black hatters, if you know your Debono stuff, uh, are very keen on the scaffold and we sometimes get frustrated because they're seeing the problems. We need to actually harness that, that, that ability that they have because they're the people that can actually help us with what are the steps we need to make to reach what might be a perfectly legitimate and wonderful vision. So there you go. There's nine behaviours that I think we need to focus on and the good news is that they exist for a reason. So you can actually work backwards by looking at these behaviours by having a look at, you know, for instance, if, uh, you know, if you don't have an idea about you know, what, what's, the, what's the story of our leadership team, we need to get simple and people engage with stories, so we might need to develop some, some leadership stories there. If people not reaching KPIs are a problem, then the idea is that we need to actually use our relationships to get more out of people. So we might need to build thick, stronger relationships and then use those to challenge whether people are actually um, meeting key performance indicators and whether we're actually capable of having the conversations around performance improvement. So I often put aside, as you can see, I'm not so very good at scaffolding, so I often was not very good at, putting, at, at conducting performance improvement conversations. So what I had to do was put, a, put a, a method in place to have a performance conversation that was very Socratic, where a lot of questions were asked and where people felt like they were actually supported in moving forward and taking the first step. My original performance improvement conversations were my 12-month tick and flick, and uh, what I realised was that they weren't engaging at all. 
So what's that about? Provide a scaffold. Provide something that people are going to do in five weeks and not something that they're going to do in 12 months if I want a, a larger improvement to begin to happen. So I can't encourage you enough to, to just have a think about what's the problem and you can work backwards to what's the behaviour that I need to deploy to be able to make a difference. Uh, so can I ask you for a second here, what, what, what was it? What out of those behaviours was your super power? Can I ask you, either in the question box or perhaps in the chat space here, to just grab the keyboard, you know, glance sideways at someone next to you if you've got someone around, and you know, right in that question area or in the chat poll, what was it that, uh, that you were able to identify as your superpower? Be brave, be bold, be, uh, be, be comfortable knowing that there's something that you're good at. There's a reason you're in a leadership position. It's because you've gotten one of these behaviours to a uh, to some sort of level of mastery. So you know, I know my superpower is the influence that I have over people. I'm proud of that. I look to make sure that that's a, a behaviour that I cultivate. And um, and what I want also is to be able to work on my kryptonite. So if you've uh, if you've had a good think about what your superpower might be, then perhaps you could put in here as well what your kryptonite is. Could you feel brave enough to tell us which of those behaviours is the one that made you go, you know what, I'm not so flash at that one. That's the one that I really need to do more work on. That's the one that I feel like I'm uh, I'm lacking in. So if you're feeling like there was a behaviour there that uh, that really sort of, you know, that uh, that stung a little bit and made you feel like you were you you that you weren't um that you weren't operating in a way that works for you, then uh, and that that's actually helping your people go forward. Then let us know about that one too. I'm really interested in know. So thank you, Linda, for letting us know that you have leverage as your superpower. Great to great to know that there's someone who's got a really strong focus on relationships and really a strong focus on relationships that actually make a difference, that actually push people forward. So have a good think about that. We, should, we want the product of today is that we want you to be able to leave understanding that what's the behaviour that's your superpower and what's the behaviour that's your, your kryptonite. Okay. So what I want to do just to finish off today, look, I want to acknowledge that in an hour we certainly don't have the opportunity to go deep and so I've been absolutely determined that I will not take a breath today. That what I will do is I will, um, I, will, I will make sure that I give you as much value as I possibly can and then tell you how you can go deep. So one of the things I'd like to offer you today for taking the time to, to jump in on this webinar today is to be able to grab a free white paper. So this is something that we put together about solving the problem of that overworked, over-accountable and highly distractible school leader. So what I want you to do using that chat or that uh, question box now is just if you, if you would type the word white paper in there if you'd like us to send you a free copy of that. This white paper sits behind a, an executive coaching program that you guys can access yourself to if you think that might be a useful thing to, do, to, to have for your team. So the coaching, the coaching offer is the opportunity to sit down and to be able to work through this kind of thinking. And um, you can do it as an individual or you can do it as a leadership team. So there's the offer for us to work in both directions there. So we want you to be able to see what the thinking is that sits behind that coaching program. And we'll also send you, whoops, we'll also send you lots of opportunity to, um, lots of information, sorry, about how that white paper can, can work for you. So I can see several people have jumped in saying, yes, give me that white paper. We're going to make sure that you get that within the next couple of days or so. So that you can have a good look at where this thinking has come from and how it might benefit your school. Um, the next thing I want you to have a little think about is the whole idea. You might have sat today going, you know what, I, when I look at that model about, about where schools are at and where my school leadership's at, but then also where my work effort is at, what Rural Schools does is we're, we're built very much around working with schools to change all three of those domains. And uh, if you sat there today going, you know what, it might be time for us that we actually work together, not as a leadership team, but as a whole school, to begin to get somewhere, just in that, in, in that question box there, just put the word partnership. Um, what we're going to do is just to make sure that you know, if you, when you write the word partnership, don't worry, you're not about to get an invoice. So what it means is that what you are going to get is the opportunity for a copy. So we're going to just book a time in for you to be able to have a little chat about what's happening in your school and to decide whether the idea of picking an improvement theme for your school around school culture, whether it might be cultural leadership like we've talked about today, whether it might be around the practice of your teachers or whether it might be around the um, around something like restorative practices. We have about half of our schools on, on um, restorative practices themed partnerships now. We've got about 40 schools around Australia now that are working in partnership with us. Not 
for a, to come and run a workshop, but to work with you over 12, 24 or 36 months to really get the change that you're looking for. So if you think that sounds okay to you and it might be time for your school, maybe it won't be, don't worry, you're not getting an invoice. Just pop the word partnership in and we're going to make sure that you get that information and you get the opportunity to just have a copy and to explore a little bit about what the next steps might be for you. So in thinking about that, you, know, you might like to go and have a look around the website. We've got a bunch of other stuff that we do. We've got a teacher fast track program for your teachers who might need some support around practice. There's a, a membership hour where you can get um, where you can get a whole bunch of resources sent to your school every month and our partner schools or member schools are already getting all of those. So go and have a sniff around the Real Schools website there and see if there's anything there that works for you. Make sure that before you leave today that you do put the you know, quick EC if you'd like to get some executive coaching going or just that word white paper. Um, you might like to just put the word partner or partnership in there if it's time for a conversation around that and we can get things going for, for you. So the thing that I always do though before we finish is I make sure that we have a chance to have a quick chat. So how have I gone time-wise? Oh, we do. Actually, this is, I think, the very first time that I've had the opportunity to you know, ensure that I actually finished in a way that might give people the chance to have a conversation. So around those topics, if you would like to uh, have a chat about any of those behaviours that, that I just asked about today, about that model, then please, by all means, would you actually pop a question in now or if you're feeling super brave, put your hand up and um, and I would love the to take the chance to you know, answer a question or two or to unmute you. It sounds such a cruel thing to say that we're going to unmute somebody as though we've got the, um, the gaffer tape over the mouth. But uh, if you would like to, to ask a question or to be unmuted to ask a question in person, pop your question in now and let's just see if there's something that we can do for your school as we, um, as we move forward. So I'm going to give you just a moment here to think about whether there's a question that you would like to ask and if you would, Use that question box. Use perhaps the chat area, or put your hand up for me and tell me what it is that you would like to talk about. Because boy, I feel like I've uh, thrown a whole heap of thinking and, and information at you today, which I guess means I hope that we have been able to adequately take your leadership thinking, your leadership practice, your uh, your your leadership behaviour for that very brisk run around the block. All right, I'll give you just a moment longer. It looks like people have uh, put a lot of information in about the white paper and about partnership. But uh, I just want to make sure we give a brief moment to see if there's any other questions. Which I'm the eternal optimist and I've decided that because we haven't got any questions that have come through today, that, uh, that what we will do is call it a day there and I'm going to, as an optimist, say that that means we must have covered so much that your brain is completely incapable of a question. So hang on, I'm just going to check. I've got one from Anthea. It's from Anthea Hudson, I'm not sure. So I'll catch up with you there, Anthea, about that one and make sure that we, uh, I think we've got some information about the work we're doing tomorrow. I hope that the, the noise level today has been good for you. Uh, we're actually you know, doing this in, uh, in a very real space today. I'm at one of our partner schools at Swan Hill Primary School in rural Victoria. So uh, if you've heard some noises like vacuum cleaners and kids leaving the school and announcement bells, then that's what that was all about. But I'll let you go there, guys. Thank you so, so much. Hang on, I'm just noticing I've got one hand up again. It's Joan. Joan, I wonder whether, before we go, Joan, can you hear me? I notice your hand's up again. Hello, it's Might have been that accidental. It's Lynette, Hello, is it? Hello, it's Lynette, Adam. Yes, I was just wondering whether your reflection model was somewhere on the website to access. I haven't got that on the metal, which is the, the, on the website, the first one. It's something that sits within our coaching program. It okay. is in the coaching prospectus and the white paper. So what I want is to make sure that I guess when people get that model that they get a little bit of information wrapped around it. And um, so if you put your, your name down there for your school to receive that white paper, you'll be able to get that model and be able to start to consider it as a team straight away. Great. Thanks, Adam. Great. Thanks. No problem at all. I'll unmute again and just check one last time before I let you go whether we've got any other questions. I've got one from Senka. How do we help teachers manage their time better? Very good question, Senka. Oh, my advice to you, Senka, Senka is one of our partner principals over at Deer Park West Primary School, so welcome, Senka, and thanks for throwing a question in there. 
So um, my advice to you around that whole idea of managing time better is that behaviour of simplify. simplify. It's thinking about what is it that we can allow. Most teachers that are managing time poorly are doing it because they're not, they haven't actually built any awareness around what's a priority and what isn't. And what we're noticing in their lack of time management is that our things that are a high priority are not a priority to them or they haven't identified it as a priority yet. So what we want to do with them is to start to simplify what it is that they have to get done and what are the things that are a good idea for them to say, you know what, there's a bit of flexibility around deadline here. Um, the other thing that I think is really important, Sanka, is perhaps my kryptonite and the whole idea of scaffolding, of making sure that we have regular rather than annual that we have regular, very focused conversations around practice and around organisation and around priorities with those teachers. So for me, I would be having, looking rather than having a one hour uh, annual performance conversation, I would be seeing if I could manage to have two or three 15 minute conversations each term with that teacher to see, just to make sure that those priorities are being kept in check and that there's a high level of uh, expectation but also through those conversations they start to feel that there's a high level of support. All right, I'm going to let everyone go there. Thank you so, so much for joining in today. Our next webinar, I'm hoping I've still got a couple of people online, our next webinar is for your teachers. I've, got, I've noticed we've got so many teachers at schools that are on uh, restorative practices I've identified restorative practices as a way forward for them. So this one's very much about how you can start to build restorative classrooms. And you know, I hear everywhere that the third, one of the problems with restorative practices is that uh, it's too soft. And for me, that's one of the myths of restorative practices. I actually think that restorative practices done well is the strongest way to build a really productive, um, relational and high performing classroom culture or climate. So that's the key thing that we're going to focus on in this webinar. It's how to build a respectful, a resilient and a responsible classroom through restorative practices. So this one's very much targeted, a bit less at you guys, but very much at your teachers. So have a good think about whether any of your teachers could, could benefit from this webinar and, um, and that one's available to you to be able to, um, to sign up for straight away. Jump on, register, get as many people involved as you can and, uh, and look, thanks again for joining us. We'll talk to you all very, very soon. Bye for now.